Well, listen, this is the, uh, and we've had you on a number of times. It's always important, but man, this may be one of the more consequential issues that, that we face uh, in this whole war so far. Uh, and I think that the, the risks and the potential for things to go bad uh, is really maybe one of your highest points right now. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think that uh, we're at a point now where it's becoming manifestly clear to most people in the West that uh, Russia is going to win the war, that Ukraine is going to lose. Exactly what the final settlement looks like is hard to say, but uh, the Russians are going to win this one. And given the deep stake that we have, we in the West have in this fight, the temptation for us to escalate, to try to rescue the situation will be great. And uh, if you look at what we've been doing with regard to talking about using ATACMs or storm shadows to strike deep into Russia, and you look at the Russian response to this, you can see that, you know, we're in a very dangerous situation. Uh, and uh, there is a real possibility of escalation. And of course, when you talk about escalation, in the case of Ukraine, you're talking about nuclear escalation. So yes, I think we're in a dangerous situation because Ukraine and the West are losing in this war. Uh, so I want to I want to ask you about before we get into some of the specifics here, uh, kind of how you view the situation, especially in light of what you just said, because it appears to me that we are at a, a maybe a tipping point between either tipping over to recognition of ground truth reality, let's get this off the table, or tipping the other side to oh hell, let's escalate, let's do something more to try and change the dynamic. Do you see any tension there? Well. The problem is that there's no way we can reverse the situation on the battlefield. This is the problem that we face. Uh, if there was sort of a magic formula for doing that, uh, we would do it. Uh, but there is no magic formula. And uh, nevertheless, we are desperate to rescue the situation. I think the Biden administration definitely doesn't want things to go really south before the November election. Uh, and there is a real possibility that that will happen. I'm not saying it's likely to happen, but if you look at what's happening in places like Vugladar and a number of other places right. along the Eastern Front, uh, it's quite clear that the Ukrainians are really in deep trouble and uh, they could collapse in a number of places, uh, not necessarily along the entire front, but in a number of key places like Vugladar. And this would then be reported in the media as a great victory for the Russians. And this would be disastrous for the Biden administration and for the Harris campaign. So they're trying to head that one off at the pass. So they're desperate to do something. And over the long term, we're going to be desperate to reverse this situation because we've gotten such a bloody nose in the process. But again, we don't really have any options. And then, you know, people begin to say we can do almost anything we want and don't have to worry about nuclear escalation. Putin and the Russians more generally have now made it clear that we better worry about escalation because they've just changed the criteria for using nuclear weapons. Uh, and it is more likely that they'll use them now than was the case uh, before they changed their doctrine. So we're out there on very thin ice and we better be really careful because otherwise we'll go through the ice. Right, right. Yeah. And we're going to we're going to look at here shortly about uh, what uh, Putin did say and, and get you to parse some of the language that he used about what that may actually mean. But before we get there, I want to kind of get a running start as to what, first of all, Zelensky said in his U.N. speech. And then secondly, what some senior ranking uh, former ambassadors are saying on on major American media. And we want to try and interpret that into reality as well. But uh, Gary, do you have that one of uh, Zelensky up there from his UN speech? Is that ready? Okay, yeah, but go ahead and roll that one first. We must restore nuclear safety. Energy must stop being used as a weapon. We must ensure food security. We need to bring home all our captured soldiers and civilians possibly deported to Russia. We must uphold the UN Charter and guarantee our right, Ukraine's right to territorial integrity and sovereignty, just as we do for any other nation. We need to withdraw the Russian occupiers, which will bring an end to the hostilities in Ukraine. And we must hold those 
responsible for war crimes accountable. We need to prevent ecocide and stop the destruction of nature caused by the war. And we must not allow a second or third phase of this Russian invasion. And we need to make it clear the war is over. This is the peace formula. What part of this could be unacceptable to anyone who upholds the UN Charter? Now, Professor, if this speech had been made, say, in uh, November of 2022, after the, the Ukraine side had forced Russia out of Kyrgyzstan uh, city and after they had taken that big swath of land back in Kharkiv, you might say, OK, this is a little bit I mean, maybe this is aspirational and maybe there's some justification to it. But coming as it is now after the complete debacle of the 2023 offensive and now then the nonstop movements by Russia to the West in both the, now the North and the East, uh, this just seems really divorced from reality. Yeah, it is divorced from reality. I like your point that if you know he had made a speech along these lines in the fall uh, of 2022, he might have stood a chance of getting the Russians to the bargaining table. And if the Ukrainians, the Americans, and the Russians had all been smart, they could have worked out a deal, uh, something along the lines of the deal that was in the process of being worked out in the uh, March, early April 2022 uh, window. Uh, but of course, uh, we were unwilling to do that, we meaning the West, and the Ukrainians went along with us. Uh, we ended the negotiations. And as you well know, what's happened since then is the balance of power has shifted drastically in the Russians' favor, and the Russians are on a roll, and they're in no mood to concede uh, to any of Zelensky's demands. So he's basically whistling in the wind here. And I would think that he knows that, and most people in the West know that as well. Well, you know, you you would think that most people in the West that know that, but let me show you a couple that don't seem to know that. And the first one is going to be Ambassador Taylor, uh, who was asked, uh, I believe it was on CNN, about the, you know Zelensky's victory plan, which at least according to the schedule is supposed to have a conversation with Biden, maybe even as we're on the air right now. We'll see how that works out there. But in terms of what's been reported, here's what he said about that victory plan. Putin has made it very clear, Jim, what he wants is to take back Ukraine, back, U back into the Soviet empire, back into the Russian empire. That's what he has said he is after. He says that there is no such thing as Ukraine, so he can just take it back. So that's what he wants. Um, and President Zelensky is the president of a real nation, of a sovereign nation, it has borders that everybody recognizes, and he is not going to give up on those borders. He has said, Jim, that there are ways to get that back, to get uh, mm. the Russians out. And part of that is militarily, and that has to do with these long-range fires and other things we'll talk about, but it also yeah. has to do diplomatically. And diplomatically, he has said he's going to take, he's never going to give up claim to those internationally recognized borders. Because that could just open up a Pandora's box, not just All for Ukraine, world, but not for just Europe. The, exactly right. China, everything Africa, else. Africa, no, yeah. exactly right. Okay, I want to ask you about two specific things that he said there. On the first one, he said there is a reasonable path for diplomatically to force Putin out. Now, we just talked about right heading into that clip that there's no military path. Is there a diplomatic path that would force Putin to change his mind? No, it's just simply uh, not possible to diplomatically uh force the Russians to give up all this territory that they've conquered. And annexed, you want to remember, they have formally annexed Crimea and they have formally annexed those four oblasts in East Ukraine. The, they say they will never give up. Uh, how, in the absence of military force, are you going to convince the Russians to give up Crimea and those four oblasts? It's just not going to happen. I would also note to you, Danny, this argument that Putin uh, is interested in conquering all of Ukraine, as Ambassador Taylor said, uh, is simply not true. He's never said any such thing. Uh, and uh, the idea that he doesn't recognize Ukraine as a sovereign state, that's simply not true. He's never said that. 
and the famous article that he wrote on July 12th, 2021, that everybody points to as evidence of the argument that the ambassador was laying out, says exactly the opposite. Putin clearly recognizes Ukrainian nationalism, and he clearly recognizes Ukraine as a sovereign state. So I don't know what he's talking about. But when you listen to those kinds of arguments coupled with this magical thinking about how Ukraine is going to diplomatically and militarily solve this problem that they now face, you kind of wonder what he's thinking. Yeah, we, uh, we're going to get to that in just a second as well. But uh, the second part of that clip I wanted to talk about was at the end of it. He said this would open if if this being Russia is allowed to win and they do that, it's going to open up this Pandora's box and it's going to cause all these other problems. And basically, there's aggressors all over the world who are just waiting to chomp at the bit that as soon as that takes place, that they're going to go launching out. What do you say to that? I just don't believe that. Uh, there's no evidence to support that argument. Uh, at this point in time. And I believe, you know, when we get together three years from now, uh, there'll be no evidence to support that argument. Uh, There is going to be a lot of trouble in the world uh, once this one is shut down, once we get a frozen conflict. There'll be a lot of trouble, but it will be mainly because the Ukrainians and the West refuse to accept Uh, Russian gains, and we will go to great lengths to undermine Russia's position in Ukraine and around the world. The Russians will, in turn, uh, punch back, and we will punch back, and they will punch back. And the end result is that we're going to have terrible relations between Russia and the West and Russia and the Ukraine for as far as the eye can see. And the potential for this frozen conflict to turn back into a hot conflict will be very great. (coughs) Excuse me, Danny, but in my opinion, it won't be the Russians' fault. Uh, It will be largely our fault because we will be unable to accept what's now happening. Well, now let's look at that. That that in, in one sense, what you just described, may be the the best case scenario for what happens on the backside of a Russian win, because the worst case scenario could be if it goes not diplomatically, but hot in terms of an engagement back and forth. And uh, this next clip here from Ambassador Taylor, he's addressing the specific issue of the long range missiles. It's critical in order to disrupt the Russian ability to continue their attack. I mean, they are taking off from airfields now. They've moved some of their airplanes back away from these long-range missiles, but they have ammo dumps that we've seen the Ukrainians go after successfully as well. This this ability to shoot deep um, will disrupt the Russians' ability to attack Ukraine. Do you think they should do it? Do you think the administration should do this? I absolutely do. Okay, let's let's unpack that one there. Uh, So let's take his argument there. First of all, he says that this will... Uh, succeed in disrupting the Russian offensive. Do you see any evidence that long-range fires of the volume that we could provide would, in fact, disrupt Russia's offensive capacity? No, I don't. I don't think we have that many missiles to give them. Uh, and here we're talking about the ATACMS uh, and you know the British missiles. Uh, just not enough. And uh, even if we give them a substantial number. The idea that the Russians can't combat those missiles and those missiles will do such devastation that Russia's position on the for, in the forward positions on the battlefield will be badly weakened. It's, it's just not a serious argument. Uh, I, I don't know anybody who knows anything about the military balance there who makes that argument. Uh, we just don't have the capability uh, and the Ukrainians are not going to have the capability uh, to disrupt what's happening on the battlefield. And it's what happens on the battlefield that matters. So the idea that the the, the attackums and the storm shadows are going to fundamentally alter the balance of forces uh, up on the front, uh, is it's a pipe dream. It's just not going to happen. You know, I've, I've often found it curious that in, in somebody like Ambassador Taylor should certainly understand this I mean, even if he's not a a military expert, I mean, he's supposed to understand how international relations work and how combat operations work to a general degree. And Russia has a a lot of air defense capacity, which they have been using uh, throughout this war. And that's one of the reasons why you almost never hear anything about the Ukrainian Air Force because of the air defense. And that includes the F-16s that are there now. So I don't know, even with this limited number, and by the way, uh, to bolster your argument there, you had Secretary of Defense Austin uh, recently say, and this was less than two weeks ago, 
that, hey, there, oh, he, okay, Gary, Gary found it. It's right there. Uh, he said, look, there's not enough ATACMs or British and French missiles, and we simply couldn't supply enough. That's what Austin is publicly telling people. Uh, and we've had uh, subsequent to that, you had uh, uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, say that also includes air defense interceptor missiles. So none of the categories of things that you would need to do this, we even have. So one wonders with those public pronouncements, why do you still keep seeing people of this nature making this argument? Just quickly, Danny, I'm quite certain that Bill Taylor, uh, the ambassador, was at West Point uh, when I was there. Uh, I think he's oh. a West Point graduate. And oh, I well, think, that's even more embarrassing. <laughs> I think he served five years in the military after he graduated. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of that, but I'm about 95% certain. But look, we, not only do we not have enough missiles to give them, but the Russians have the ability to deal with these missiles. Not every one of them, but most of them. They've been very successful at dealing with HIMARS. HIMARS looked like a war-winning weapon at first, but eventually the Russians figured out, and actually rather quickly, they figured out how to deal with the HIMARS, and they now don't matter that much. The same, true was, same was true with these Excalibur artillery rounds that looked like magical weapons at first. Uh, but the Russians quickly and easily figured out how uh, to neutralize them. And the same thing is true with this, with regard to the limited number of ATACMs, and storm shadows that we give to the Ukrainians, if we give it to them. That's point one. Point two, which is of enormous importance, <laughs> the Russians have just changed their nuclear doctrine to make it clear that if we allow the Ukrainians to strike deep into Russia with ATACMs and storm shadows, that they will contemplate using nuclear weapons against us. This should uh, really uh, convince people that this is a terrible idea. And, and you know, and one of the other things, if, and, and I don't want to hit on that in specific about the, the change nuclear doctrine in just a second, but staying on the tactic or conventional battlefield for the second, even if we were somehow able to come up with enough missiles, let's say that whatever we hold back in our war chest in case we ever need them, whatever that number is, it's secret. No one knows, but there's, it's probably hopefully anyway, robust. But if we said, you know what, this is so important. We're going to, we're literally just going to hand it all to them. And so they will be able to conduct this at a long range. Even if they did that, then the next half of the equation that they're not addressing is then what? Where does Ukraine have the capacity to form the offensive potential to push Russia out to achieve this so-called peace? Do you see any prospect, even if aside from what Russia may do or if the missiles came across, that they can form, say, in 2025 or even 2026, an offensive capacity sufficient to push Russia out? Well, let's lower the bar and ask whether they can form a defensive capacity, right? An offensive capacity would involve many more troops than a defensive capacity. They presently do not have the ability to stop the Russians. And I do not see any way that over the course of the rest of this year and 2025, that we can provide the Ukrainians with enough weaponry and they can raise enough troops to hold the line. In other words, we're talking about a defensive mission here, not an offensive mission. I don't think that's possible to do. I think the balance of power has already shifted decisively in the Russians' favor. And if you look at what the situation is moving forward, the balance is going to shift further in the Russians' favor. So the Ukrainians are doomed even a purely defensive mode. But if you talk about going on the offensive. I mean, they tried this in the summer of 2023 when they were in much better shape in terms of the balance of power than they are today or will be next year. And you know what happened in 2023. They got cut to doll rags. The offensive or counteroffensive, whatever you want to call it, was a colossal failure. Uh, so there is no hope of the Ukrainians uh, recapturing uh, lost territory. And as I said, I don't think there's any chance of them even remaining on the defensive and being able to put up a good fight uh, for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And, you know, on that on that second point there, 
uh, and we won't go into a, a tactical analysis right now, but there have been a couple of developments. You mentioned Vugladar earlier uh, on the there, basically that town that Russia had been trying to get for a year and eight months uh, and it had been repulsed every time. I think there was a total of six operations to do that time. Uh, they have now chosen to flank it both the north and the south. And there was some very interesting video footage coming out of the southern pincer that is starting to close in behind it is that the Russians have been moving in uh, relatively large numbers of armored formations in, in mass on the backside and they've not been stopped because they, they don't have enough, the Ukraine side doesn't have enough uh, mines, they don't have enough drones, and they don't have enough artillery. And so now then you're seeing big movements. And I think that that presages uh, some faster movements even before, because if they can't stop that, then there's probably other places they can't stop it. But uh, just yeah, that, one additional, sure. very quickly, Danny, you didn't mention manpower. They're also greatly outnumbered in terms of manpower, right. in addition to all of the categories of weapons that you described. And, you know, you read some stories coming from the Ukrainian side that say that in terms of manpower at a number of critical locations along the front, they're outnumbered eight to one. And in terms of artillery, they're outnumbered 10 to one. I've seen two or three references to these ratios. This is stunning. The Ukrainians are saying they're outnumbered in terms of manpower, eight to one. Wow. Artillery, 10 to 1. Remember, artillery is responsible for roughly 80 plus percent of the casualties in this war. And if the other side, we're talking about looking at this situation from Ukraine's perspective, if the other side has a 10 to 1 advantage in artillery and you're outnumbered 8 to 1 in terms of manpower, you're you're finished. It's, it's, it's a fatal ratio. I it's mean, fatal. yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what we do at this point in time or what the Ukrainians do. The the, the ratios here, the manpower ratios, the, the ratios in weaponry on the ground. And we didn't even talk about air power. Right. right. The, the right. Ukrainians have virtually no air power and the Russians have a lot of air power uh, and a lot of missiles. Uh, and they're wrecking, you know, the energy infrastructure inside of Ukraine, which is going to have devastating consequences now that the winter is coming. Right, so right. Anybody can be telling a story, uh, as Ambassador Taylor is trying to do, about how Ukraine can rescue the situation, I think is living in a dream world. Okay, and, and speaking of living in a dream world, uh, it's one thing for a former ambassador to say something on television, but it's a different thing when it's the Secretary of State at the United Nations Security Council. One of the Council's primary responsibilities is seeking to peacefully resolve conflicts. As President Zelensky has said, no one wants peace more than Ukraine. The United States also wants to end this conflict. And before Putin launched his full invasion, we used every tool we could to try to prevent it, including right here at the Security Council. But the way the Council seeks to end this conflict matters. The UN Charter is crystal clear on this point. When fulfilling its responsibilities, the Security Council, and I quote, shall act in accordance with the purpose and principles of the United Nations, end quote. In other words, we must seek a peace that upholds rather than undermines the UN's core tenets. Okay, a couple of things on that. I, I want to start off with one of the first things he said there is that we used every tool diplomatically to prevent this war from starting. Did we really? No, the exact opposite is the case. We basically provoked this war. Uh, the Russians were desperate to avoid a war. All you have to do is go back and look at the December 17, uh, 2021 letter that Putin sent to both Jens Stoltenberg, the head of NATO, and to President Biden. Uh, suggesting a deal and talking about getting together to figure out how to shut this conflict down and avoid uh, a war. And uh, we basically, in fact, it was Tony Blinken, gave the Russians the high sign. We told them we're not interested. And we continued to push and push and push. And then when the Russians uh, invaded uh, on February 24th, 2022, the Russians immediately thereafter uh, sent a signal to the Ukrainians that they wanted to start peace negotiations. They wanted to end the war. This is right after they started it. Why? Because the Russians had no interest in a war. And uh, the peace negotiations were moving along quite well. There was no final agreement for sure. And one 
can never be certain that an agreement would have been worked out. But they were making major progress for sure uh, throughout March and early April. And lo and behold, the United States and the British basically tell the Ukrainians that they should walk away from the negotiations and we should continue the fight. That's how the United States has acted. Uh, the idea that we tried to prevent this war and then we tried to shut it down and produce peace once it started is, again, not a serious argument. The yeah, and in fact, it's just the truth. They're just mind boggling. Yeah. They're so divorced from the facts. I, I kind of don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you saw it. I think it was uh, 10 days, two weeks ago. Gerhard Schroeder, the former uh, the chancellor for Germany uh, expressly validated what you just said there. They said that it was undermined that Zelensky was moving towards peace, which he made some public comments about being willing to go neutral prior to that meeting in Istanbul. Uh, and then we all know what happened afterwards. So that's a, that's clearly a, a true statement. Ergo, what the secretary of state just said at that meeting was not. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about from what or ask you about from what he just said there is he keeps raising up this issue of the U.N. charter. And we want to be able to find a, a negotiated settlement in terms of peace. We want peace according to the U.N. charter. Does the U.N. charter defend the Ukrainian side? And is there any different viewpoint that the Russian could see? Can you see on that U.N. charter as well? How do you see those that dis, uh, uh, dis, disparity? I'm not sure he what exactly he means. I mean, he doesn't unpack it. Uh, the UN Charter is a vague document. It's a document that hardly anybody can disagree with. And I'm sure that the Russians can come up with a clever story that explains how their behavior uh, is consistent with the UN Charter, just like the Ukrainians do and just like the Americans do. But in the final analysis, it doesn't matter. In the final analysis, what matters here is the balance of power on the Eastern Front in Ukraine. That's how this war is going to be settled. It's tragic for sure. The war should have never happened. And once it did happen, it should have been shut down by uh, April of 2022. It wasn't. And once it wasn't shut down, uh, it was inevitable that it would be settled at the end of a rifle barrel. And that's what's happening. I regret that situation greatly. But uh, that's what matters here, not the U.N. Charter. These people can talk till they're blue in the face about the U.N. Charter, but it just doesn't matter much anymore. And it doesn't matter much to the Russians because the United States uh, has acted in ways uh, in the past that have convinced the Russians that you don't want to trust the Americans as far as you can throw them. And that includes Donald Trump as well as uh, Tony Blinken and Joe Biden. The Russians have given up trusting the Americans. They're going to settle this one on the battlefield, pure and simple. And 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 speaking of, of the politics in the United States and the upcoming presidential election, uh, Zelensky landed into what he thought was going to be a, a brilliant, beautiful photo op of going to the Scranton, Pennsylvania uh, weapons factory to thank a bunch of people for what happened there. But lo and behold, it has not exactly worked out well for him. Here's this uh, article from the the. Um, uh, the uh, the Hill from yesterday, where the um, uh, Speaker Johnson, the Speaker of the House, has demanded that Ukraine fire their ambassador because of some comments that were made and the fact that and the argument that they the the Republican House is making that uh, this Zelensky whole thing was set up as a as a photo op for the Democratic Party. That seems pretty unusual to me that such a demand would be made while Zelensky's still in town. How did you see that? Well. It's very clear that Zelensky has a vested interest in Harris winning and Trump losing. I mean, Trump is a nightmare for Zelensky, even before this whole incident took place. And Pennsylvania is a battle state. It really matters. And uh, what Zelensky did, uh, whether he did it on purpose or he did it accidentally, my guess is he didn't realize that he was jumping into a hornet's nest. Uh, but he did jump into a hornet's nest, and it looks like he is working with the Democrats uh, to shore up their position in Pennsylvania. Again, I'm not accusing him of doing that on purpose, yeah. but that's what it looks like that you know well, his buddies in the Democratic Party uh, are joined at the hip with him, and they're interested in fighting and winning this war. And of course, Trump and the Republicans, who were suspicious of Zelensky. Uh, to say the least, 
uh, to begin with, uh, have interpreted this as an attempt to undermine Trump's position in Pennsylvania, and they are striking back. This is yeah. disastrous for uh, Ukraine, whether Trump wins or not, because if Harris wins, they'll blame it in part on Zelensky, and the Republicans will be uh, more interested than ever in not giving any more aid to Zelensky. So he's yeah. really- and, and, and obviously it's, I, I feel very confident that it wasn't Zelensky's desire to go there. They probably, the administration set that and he just went where he was told since he came in on an American C-17 transport plane. Uh, but the bigger issue, again, perceptions matter. And so here is what really in the aftermath of, of all of this, here's what Trump is now saying. Biden and Kamala got us into this war in Ukraine, and now they can't get us out. They can't get us out. I watched him. We will win. We will. He's been saying that for three years. But we're stuck in that war unless I'm president. I'll get it done. I'll get it negotiated. I'll get out. We got to get out. Biden says, we will not leave until we win. What happens if they win? That's what they do is they fight wars. As somebody told me the other day, they beat Hitler, they beat Napoleon. That's what they do, they fight. Now, that, I know you're an international relations theorist, that's your primary thing, but I'm sure you do pay some attention to American politics. There is a, a bill on the table right now for a new $8 billion package, and that would have to go through the Republican House. Do you see any chance that that bill is gonna make it uh, to the light of day? Uh. I don't know. Uh, I'd say the odds are clearly against it at this point. Uh, I mean, I, I think, as we were saying a minute ago, that uh, President Zelensky, he made a huge mistake here. Again, it was probably accidental, but nevertheless, he made that mistake. And he's enraged Trump and the Republicans more generally. And there'll be a serious price to pay for this. Uh, you know, my view on this, as you know, and We'll probably talk about this later is we got to shut the war down anyway right away uh so if this uh whole uh kerfuffle leads us uh or leads the ukrainians to move towards some sort of negotiated settlement sooner rather than later i think it would be in ukraine's interest uh so i want to move on to uh to how some other in, in the aftermath of that uh gary i'm going to jump ahead a little bit i'm going to miss uh, skip the first book or go to right to the second one here uh because basically he's that would have been a quote saying similar things that we've had before and we've already covered it uh but volker here ambassador volker subsequent to that to, to trump's comments here uh is going on to say hey you know we can still force Putin to stop diplomatically. But then he makes this announcement analogy that I hear so oftentimes, not just here, but across the board, that basically it's always 1938 somewhere. And we're talking about uh, appeasement is in the air. Watch this. A lot of people would like to think that if Ukraine just gives up some territory, then there'll be peace. But that's a fallacy. That, that is just rewarding Putin's aggression so far and whetting his appetite for more that he's going to say, OK, I'll take that. And then he'll be up against the Polish border. He'll be looking at the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, saying, well, they used to be part of the Soviet Union, too. So I should be taking them. So it's it's a, a set of wishful thinking to think that you could just give up some territory, for, you know, give up Ukrainian territory and then there's peace. There's not um, what we saw with the uh, Japanese, what we saw with Hitler, um, People who are trying to build an empire at the expense of other people who have this imperialist agenda, they, they just have to be stopped. So you just said prior to that clip there that what we need to do is get this war over with as soon as possible. But here you have Ambassador Volker saying, not so fast, because if you do, man, Poland, the bolts, they're gone. What do you say to that? There's no evidence to support that argument. I want to see the evidence that Putin has imperial ambitions. He's never said anything about conquering all of Ukraine, number one. And number two, he has never said anything about conquering any countries beyond Ukraine. The idea that he's trying to recreate the Soviet Union, rebuild the Soviet empire in Eastern Europe is uh, simply not true. There's just no evidence. That's point number one. 
Point number two is to do that, you would need an army that has well over a million men. You'd need an army that probably has somewhere between two and three million men to conquer these countries and to occupy them because you got to occupy them after you conquer them because the people are not going to be happy about being conquered by the Russian army. He does not have an army that can conquer all of Ukraine, much less one that he can send into Eastern Europe. Look at all the trouble the Russians have had over the past two and a half years uh, conquering Eastern Ukraine. It's a tough nut to crack. The Russian army is not that big and it's not that good. Uh, it's better than the Ukrainian army for sure, and it's improving day by day. Yes, but is it big enough to overrun all of Ukraine and Eastern Europe? Is this the second coming of the Wehrmacht? Is Vladimir Putin Adolf Hitler with an insatiable appetite for conquest? No, he's not. There's no evidence that he's thinking that way, and there's no evidence he has the capability to behave that way. So I don't know what to say when I hear people like Volcker talking. I just uh, find it hard to understand how they can make arguments like that, given the basic facts of the situation. Now, one of the reasons why I show those kinds of clips is because these folks are continuing to at least publicly encourage the Biden administration to give these long range weapons because they say, well, that'll change it. Even though we just talked about because uh, Ambassador Taylor also said the same, that it would change the dynamics. And we talked about uh, really how it won't do that. But it's almost like that's just that's not getting into the ears. They still are saying, let's give it. But now then we have something new from the Russian side. We've alluded to this in the first part. Now I want to take a look at this. And especially I want you to use your international theorist translator uh, and to tell us what uh, uh, Putin means when he says, here's how he has changed his nuclear doctrine. Watch this. Предложено внести ряд уточнений в части определения условий применения ядерного оружия. Так, в проекте основ расширена категория государств и военных союзов, в отношении которых проводятся ядерные сдерживания. Дополнен перечень военных угроз, для нейтрализации которых выполняются мероприятия ядерного сдерживания. На что еще особо хотел бы обратить ваше внимание. В обновленной редакции документа агрессию против России со стороны любого неядерного государства, но с участием или при поддержке ядерного государства предлагается рассматривать как их совместное нападение на Российскую Федерацию. So he has he has basically changed his doctrine. We had Lavrov about uh, 10 or so days ago said that they were updating their nuclear doctrine. And now here Putin actually says it. What's different about this? If you look at the old doctrine, he said that the Russians would consider using nuclear weapons if an adversary, if an adversary invaded with conventional forces and threaten the survival of the state, okay? Here, he is not talking about an adversary invading with conventional forces and threatening the survival of the state. He's basically saying that if Ukraine launches missiles at Russia, and those missiles are missiles that were supplied by the West, he will consider using nuclear weapons. So this is a fundamental change in the doctrine, right? In other words, we're not talking about Ukraine and the United States and NATO allies invading Russia and heading towards Moscow, threatening the survival of Russia. That was what the original doctrine said would be the contingency where the Russians would consider using nuclear weapons. That's not the issue here. He's saying if a country like Ukraine merely launches Western-supplied conventional weapons. We're not talking about nuclear weapons. Western-supplied conventional weapons at Russia. Russia will contemplate using nuclear weapons. So he's saying that if we give them ATACMs and we give them storm shadows and we give them in large numbers and the Ukrainians use them to hit Russia, the Russians will consider using nuclear weapons against Ukraine and presumably against the West. Uh, that's not to say they will use them, but they will contemplate using that, using them. Yeah. 
Now, the, the <laughs> argument is we, we actually had uh, General Ben Hodges on the show, surprisingly, last week. And I asked him about that. And he says, oh, no, there's there's zero chance that Russia would ever do that. And that that echoes something you hear a lot. Uh, here's John Bolton giving uh, voice to what a lot of people on the West actually think. If you're worried about what Putin said and we react accordingly, you're going to give him what we what he wants uh, at absolutely no cost to him. My, my response to Putin's remark as to earlier threats involving nuclear weapons is to say to him privately and publicly, if Russia uses a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin has signed his personal death warrant. So the view is, and, and actually, and, and we're going to see this in a clip a second ago, or in a second, where you were on Piers Morgan, and we're going to ask you some specific things about that, because that was similar. But he made a similar comment in his show there that he'll never do that because he'll be vaporized, I think is the term he used. What do you say to all these people when they say, basically, there's no way Putin will ever use nuclear weapons? Well, there are a number of points to be made. First of all, how do these people know that he won't use nuclear weapons? How do they know? Are they inside his brain? Do they know what will happen inside his brain in a crisis situation a month from now or a year from now? There's no way you could know, right? And there has to be some possibility. It may be small, but there has to be some possibility he will use nuclear weapons. So to simply declare that there's no way Putin will use nuclear weapons, period, end of story, is irresponsible in the extreme. Uh, the second point is you want to remember that if we incinerate Russia, Russia will incinerate us. Right? We live in what's called a mad world. We live in a world of mutual assured destruction. Underline that word mutual, right? Both sides can destroy the other side. So whether we attack first or Putin attacks first in a general thermonuclear war doesn't matter because both sides are going to be destroyed. In fact, the planet is probably going to be destroyed. So the idea that if Putin uses nuclear weapons in Ukraine, right, and we then take out Russia and Putin with nuclear weapons, and we get away with this scot-free, this is delusional, right? This is a world where we're talking about nuclear weapons. These are called weapons of mass destruction for good reason. And then the final point I would make to you is, you want to remember that Putin can use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, and he doesn't have to fear retaliation because the Ukrainians don't have nuclear weapons of their own. And if Putin were to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, we would certainly not retaliate with nuclear weapons of our own, in large part because that would invite the Russians to hit us, and we would all end up getting vaporized, and we don't want that. So you can tell plausible stories about how Putin uses nuclear weapons in Ukraine and gets away with it. This is not to say he will do it. But again, to get back to my earlier point, we cannot be sure he won't do it. Uh, and, and let me ask you this. Uh, so you, you clarified that he said they reserve the right to, not that they said it's a trigger and we will. Do you think that there is additional, and I've, I've heard this from some commentators, uh, risk that if we allow, you know, whether it's a, a tech and storm shadow at all uh, to be used and they strike something deep inside Russia, that they could retaliate with conventional weapons on NATO territory, which they know would trigger an Article 5 compound, you know, the discussion, but that they, I, I've heard that the Russian side may calculate that you won't escalate because if we go nuclear, then it's almost the same Bolton argument in reverse that they don't think that they would sacrifice the Western Europe or United States for anything happening inside Ukraine. Do you think that there's a possibility that Russia could launch a conventional weapon at like say an ammo depot in Poland? I bet a huge amount of money that if we gave the Ukrainians permission to use ATACMs and storm shadows to hit Russia and they did, that the Russians, were they to respond, and I think they would respond, they would not use nuclear weapons. They would do as you described. They would use their conventional weapons to attack some of our assets, maybe in Germany or Poland. Who knows for sure? But they're not axiomatically going to use nuclear weapons. There's an escalation ladder here. And if you're the Russians, uh, 
and even if you're the West and you're playing this game, what you want to do is start out on one of the bottom rungs of the escalation ladder. Yeah. You don't want to start off using nuclear weapons. Because again, we're talking about Ukraine using atacums and storm shadows. And as you and I made clear, we both know this very well, these weapons are not going to matter very much. Given the fact that they don't matter very much in terms of their military effect, the Russians are not going to retaliate with nuclear weapons. So they'll start down at the bottom of the escalation ladder. But then you have to ask yourself, what will we do? And we, of course, will retaliate. They will retaliate. And this is when you begin to march up the escalation ladder. And you're talking about, in the case of the United States and Russia, two very powerful countries that are armed at armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons. And what do the escalation dynamics look like as we go up that ladder? Who knows? We don't have any experience uh, of a case like this in the historical record. So we're not too sure what it'll look like. And by the way, not to get carried away here talking about IR theory, if you talk about IR theory, one of the black holes in the literature, because we've not been able to do much in this area, uh, is the escalation subject. There's not a good literature on escalation. Escalation is one of those subjects we just don't understand very well. And we certainly, thankfully, don't understand nuclear escalation. So my point to you, Danny, is once we're out on the ladder, even if we start down at the bottom on the conventional rungs and we begin to go up the ladder, uh, who knows what's going to happen? And this is why when you hear people like Bolton and, you know, Piers Morgan and others say that there's no way the Russians would ever use nuclear weapons, you sort of scratch your head and say, uh, you guys should know better. You're both old enough to remember the Cold War. And during the Cold War, we worried about these scenarios all the time. And for very good reason. We don't want to get vaporized. Right. Uh, and in fact, speaking of the Piers Morgan, I, I'm, I'm going to play a clip here from a question that he asked you toward the end of that uh, your most recent uh, interview with him, which I found interesting. The, the context of this question was that he was saying that not supplying Ukraine with all the weapons that they need, not giving them long range weapons is immoral. Now, you are going to answer that question here about how you think the opposite that it's immoral to keep going and and feel free to talk on that in just a second but there are several questions he asked in there and doesn't give you a chance to answer any of them and we're going to here first here's the clip let's be honest about this what putin does he just waves his nuclear rattle and he terrifies people but every red line that he set has been crossed he said if you if you give them tanks that will be a red line for me. We did. He didn't do anything. He said, if you give them aircraft, air fighter jets, that's a red line. We crossed that red line. Nothing happened. A and so on. There is no evidence that he means any of his saber rattling about nuclear weapons because he knows the moment he uses a nuclear weapon, he's dead and Russia's vaporized. That's the reality. And I don't know why we allow ourselves to be held ransom by this monstrous dictator who just thinks that a nuclear deterrent means he can just go, I'm going to nuke you if you don't let me do what I want. That, to me, is immoral. So, so first of all, I do I want to get your view because I, I, the, the immoral aspect is very important to me. Why do you argue it is immoral to continue to support weapons to uh, Ukraine? Well, as you and I have both argued, in fact, together at the Council on Foreign Relations earlier this yeah. year, uh, the Ukrainians are doomed to lose the war, and it makes eminently good sense, given that fact, uh, to settle the war as quickly as possible so that we can minimize the number of Ukrainians who are killed and make sure that the Ukrainians uh, keep as much of their territory as possible. Uh, it just seems to me that from a moral point of view, and I'm sure you agree with me on this, what we want to do is minimize the killing of yes. Ukrainians. We want to minimize the killing of Russians as well. And let's put an end to this war. Piers's argument is that uh, uh, what we should do is continue to fight. And uh, in, in effect, as I said, fight to the last Ukrainian. Well, you know, what's interesting, you said it, he said it. He, he actually said, and I wish I had clipped that part of it out, he said, yes, even if we go to the very last man, they should. we should continue to give it on. And, and I wanted to scream into the camera that, wait a minute, you're going to enable them to all die? I mean, what sense does that make? But that seems to have been lost on him. But uh, yeah. 
Yeah. So, it, I mean, he believes that's the morally correct thing to do. I guess, you know, you could make that argument. It doesn't convince me. It's and I morally was, right for them all to die. I mean, <laughs> don't see how that works. But uh, the, anyway, the, the, I want to get to the things that, that you didn't get a chance to address in that. The first one is that he says something that, I, again, I hear a lot of different places, which is why I want to include it here, where he said that there are uh, Putin – uh, had a red line on on tanks, and then he had a red line on jets, and on then on long range, uh, you know, middle range weapons, etc. We crossed them all, and nothing happened. Ergo, nothing will. What do you say to that? Well, I don't see much evidence that Putin was drawing red lines on tanks and other weapons like HIMARS uh, before, uh, and I think that he is drawing a clear red line here. Uh, with the Atacums and the Storm Shadows. It's just a very different situation. There's no question that the Russians did everything they could uh, to tell us not to escalate in terms of the weaponry that we were pushing into Ukraine. Yeah. They were not happy about the tanks, the HIMARS, the Excaliburs, you name it. And it's understandable from a Russian point of view. But they were not drawing firm red lines back then. They just weren't. Uh, this is a story that people now make up. Uh, they are drawing a firm red line here. And if you look at the new uh, Russian nuclear doctrine, which we just talked about, that is a clear red line. Uh, and we better treat that red line differently than all of these pink lines or whatever they were uh, in the past. This is a whole different ball game here. And uh, yeah. Maybe the case that you know the Russians won't use nuclear weapons. You know the Boltons of the world could be right, but there's also a substantial chance they could be wrong. And given the consequences here, uh, the probability of nuclear use does not have to be very high to scare the living bejesus out of me. Uh, I understand full well what would happen if we get into a German general thermonuclear war, and I don't want that under any circumstances. Uh, so uh, I would be uh, very respectful if I were a Western policymaker of uh, what Putin is saying about uh, using attackums and storm shadows against uh, Mother Russia. Uh, the, the second question I was going to ask you about that you actually just answered before I even showed the clip, which is where he says it, it, it would for sure we would vaporize Putin and that would be the end. So he definitely won't do it. And you've already answered that question there. But but here's what I would like you to to address this, the, his mentality there, whether it's him, Bolton, Hodges, uh, Jack Keane, you name it. There's quite a number of people that hold those kinds of views. Well, the, both of the ambassador, Taylor and, and, and Volker, they're also saying, just don't worry about that threat. Just keep giving them his stuff. Now, if there's two scenarios, I want to, I want to ask what, what, how you would see it playing out. The one scenario is that we give the the Russians the uh, I'm sorry the Ukrainians the weapons and they use them on Russia and they attack conventionally as we said in a scenario just a second ago. What is is the how do you see this mentality from Piers Morgan et al. Uh, being willing to walk down that escalation ladder that you were talking about instead of ramping it up? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Uh... Well, I, what I'm saying is we, you and I are sitting here saying the rational thing is don't go up the escalation ladder because it has a, a fatal end for everybody here. But this mentality that already is here, they're already saying take the risk. Would they change their mind if the first rung has been reached and we've been hit on a conventional territory on whether Poland, Germany, et cetera? I don't think so. Uh, I think they continue up the ladder. Uh, I think, you know, there's this Russian strategist who I know reasonably well, Sergei Kar Kagar Karaganov, who, who basically argues that the West has lost sight of just how horrible a nuclear war would be. And that what we, the Russians, have to do is we have to use nuclear weapons to send a very clear signal to the West uh, just what the nature of the game is that we are playing here. Uh, and uh, when I listen to people like Bolton and Piers Morgan and others talk, I, I think there may be uh, a lot of truth in what Karaganov says, that uh, people in the West, a lot of people in the West, just don't think there's any serious threat that the Russians would use nuclear weapons. Uh, they think that, that nuclear weapons are so horrible, the Russians would never use them. We can slap the Russians around, and they're just not going to do anything about it. 
And Karaganov's argument is that uh, this is the way they think, and the only way that's going to disabuse them of this kind of thinking is to launch a nuclear weapon or two and uh, teach them the basic facts of life. Uh, and I'm not advocating that that happen. I want to make very clear. Yeah. But you do have the sense when you listen to people like Bolton and others speak that they just think that we can go up the escalation ladder uh, and it will remain conventional forever and ever. Uh, and yeah, I've, I've heard that from some Russian sources I've talked to as well about their their thinking in that direction. Uh, last question I've got for you here is from the other side of that equation. What kind of pressure would Putin be under, given what he just said yesterday, if long range weapons are used on his territory for him to not respond? What if he doesn't like, he doesn't want to use nuclear weapons. He doesn't want to get vaporized as, as Piers Morgan said there, but he also doesn't strike in, in uh, NATO territory. Basically he doesn't do anything. What are the risks for Putin to not make good on his claim here? It's hard for me to imagine him not doing something. If we give the Ukrainians a Takums and storm shadows uh, and give them the green light to use them in, in a serious way, uh, I find it hard to imagine that having drawn this red line and being under significant pressure from people like Karaganov and others, that Putin would do nothing. As I said to you before, I do not think he would use nuclear weapons. Uh, I think he would use conventional weapons. And I'm not sure he'd strike into Western or Eastern Europe, as you were alluding to. He might. Uh, he might go after our satellites uh, mm. or something like that. He might go after a naval ship uh, of ours. Who knows for sure? But uh, it would have to be, I think, a substantial response on his part at the conventional level. Uh, because the problem that he's beginning to run into uh, is that we just don't, let me put it differently, because the Biden administration, for all the problems I have with the Biden administration, they basically agree with us on this issue, which is that we're playing with fire. So the Biden administration has been quite cautious. Uh, and here we're talking mainly about the Pentagon, not people like Tony Blinken. Uh, but anyway, the Biden administration has been quite cautious, and let's hope that uh, remains the case. But nevertheless, there are just so many Americans who are so cavalier about the threat of nuclear escalation that Putin has to think that he's got to send a clear message at some point that he's serious or the Russians are serious about escalation. And hopefully he will do that if he feels compelled to do it with conventional weapons and not by using nuclear weapons. And I'm sorry, let me ask one, one, one follow-up because it's kind of important here. Given the presidential election and how close we are to the end, how might uh, Biden thread the needle to not give the authorization to use these uh, weapons, but not be seen as, quote, giving in to Putin's, you know, nuclear blackmail, as many are calling it here, and still not be seen as weak so that his electorate, how how can he thread that needle? He can't. He, he either gives them permission to use the ATACMs and the storm shadows, or he doesn't. Uh, and if he doesn't give them permission, uh, he's going to take a lot of heat. Uh, I think that he will be able to stand the heat. I mean, I don't think he cares that much uh, since he's not going to be president uh, after January. And furthermore, up to now, he has understood the danger of nuclear escalation. There are a number of people out there, thankfully, who do understand just how dangerous this situation is. And, uh, and Biden is one of them. I I'm no big fan of Joe Biden's foreign policy, as you well know. But I think on this issue, uh, he's been quite smart. And there are all sorts of people in the Pentagon who understand this, uh, even if Tony Blinken doesn't and a handful of other people. And uh, so hopefully we will avoid disaster. Well, let's let's hope so. We, we should be able to find out sometime later today. Apparently that meeting is happening at the White House today. But uh, thank you very much for coming on, Professor. It's always so illuminating. We're always very grateful. Uh, and, and by the way, just, uh, just a reminder, you know, go visit, uh, uh, if you can't get enough of John Mearsheimer, cause I know we, we'd love to have you on every, every other day if we could, but, uh, you so busy and so much in demand here, but go to Mearsheimer substack.com, uh, Mearsheimer dot substack.com. Sorry. You can get as much of John as you'd like. <laughs> 
So, but so thanks. And we'll look forward to having you on the next time and we'll be watching how this stuff unfolds. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Danny. I look forward to the next time as well.